Simo Hauha, the White Death, the world's deadliest sniper. Simo Hauha is considered to be the greatest sniper of all time, reported to have taken 505 kills. All of his sniper kills would be achieved during the Winter War of 1939 to 1940. Simo was born in a village in Finland near the Russian border. In his village, he would farm and take up hobbies in hunting, shooting, and snow skiing. At age 17, he joined the Civil Guard and established himself as an excellent marksman in target shooting competitions and demonstrated excellent skiing abilities. During this time, he was familiarized with the Finnish Mosin Nagant 2830 and the Suomi submachine gun. Constant practice enables Simo to hit the target 16 times per minute at around 500 feet or 150 meters away. This was incredible considering the Mosin Nagant is a bolt action rifle and holds five round stripper clips. In 1939, the Soviet Union invaded Finland, which would become known as the Winter War or the Russo Finnish War. The Finns were outnumbered but knew the land well and used guerrilla style tactics to take on the Red Army. Simo saw his baptism of fire on the Kola battlefield, where at one point there were 4,000 Soviets against only himself and 31 other Finns. On December 21, 1939, Simo achieved his highest daily count of 25 kills. Simo would go out dressed in winter snow camouflage and take a day's worth of supplies, crawl to his position, and sit in the snow for hours in temperatures as low as minus 40 degrees Celsius or minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit. He would also camouflage his position by packing snow in front of him to prevent the muzzle blast wafting up snow and put snow in his mouth to control the vapor of his breath from giving away his position. The rifle he used throughout the war was the same Finnish Civil Guard variant of the Mosin Nagant rifle that he trained with during his time in the Civil Guard, known as the M2830. This rifle featured front sights known as the Spitz because they resembled the Spitz dog. Simo preferred to use iron sights instead of a scope, which were obtained from a captured Soviet version of the rifle. This is because the scopes could give away his position, reflecting the sun's glare or cloud up in the cold environment. He would zero his sights at the common combat distance of 150 meters. One combat engagement came after Simo was assigned to take out a Soviet sniper who had killed three platoon leaders. He found a position and waited for several hours. As the sun was setting, he noticed its rays reflecting off the sniper's scope in the distance. The enemy sniper started to stand up to go back, and Simo pulled the trigger, taking him out in one shot. The Soviets took the threat of Simo seriously and deployed counter snipers and artillery strikes to try to take him out. He even gained a nickname, the White Death. Simo was wounded in the last week of the war when a Soviet infantryman shot him with an explosive bullet. The bullet hit Simo's face, but he was evacuated in time before the Finns were overrun. He was decorated with numerous awards and promoted from corporal straight to second lieutenant. Later in the Winter War on February 17, 1940, Simo was also awarded with a specially made honorary rifle Model 28 from Swedish businessman Eugen Johansson. By the end of the Winter War, Simo was credited with 505 confirmed sniper kills of Soviet soldiers, which he achieved within 100 days and in the time of year where daylight hours are low. This makes him the record holder for the highest number of confirmed sniper kills. He had also reported 200 kills with his Suomi KP-31 machine gun. When the bullet hit Simo, it had tore into his left jawbone and knocked out some of his teeth, which he needed several surgeries to fix. However, he would eventually make a recovery and live a long life. The Russian Sniper Who Killed 242 Enemy Soldiers The sniper's role in warfare is to stay concealed at all times and avoid detection then, from long range, eliminate valuable targets or cause disruption using high-precision rifles and, if possible, high-magnification optics. Snipers also carry out valuable secondary roles, such as gathering intelligence on troop positions. Snipers are a special breed and are highly skilled individuals. They require cunning and patience and, as well as being a skilled marksman, he or she must be an expert in camouflage, survival craft, infiltration, and reconnaissance techniques. 
By World War II, the sniper had become an essential component, and all the major nations had set up specialist training schools. These schools produced men like Private Bruno Sutkus of the German Army, who had achieved 209 confirmed kills by the age of 21 and in 1944 was awarded the Iron Cross first and second class for outstanding bravery. And then there was the Russian Vasily Zaitsev, born into a peasant family in the rugged snow-capped Ural Mountains in Russia, which marks the divide between Europe and Asia. Zaitsev learned to hunt deer and wolves from an early age with his grandfather. Remarkably, he killed his first wolf at the age of 12 with his single-shot rifle. In 1937, at the age of 22, he joined the Soviet Navy. He was made a clerk and posted to the city of Vladivostok, near the Chinese border, which was the home port of the Soviet Pacific Fleet. By the time Germany broke the molotov ribbentrop non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union in June 1941, Zaitsev had risen to the rank of Chief Petty Officer. Eager to defend the motherland, he voluntarily transferred to the Red Army as a senior warrant officer in order to be sent to the front line. He was assigned to the 1047th Rifle Regiment of the Tomsk Division. In September 1942, Zaitsev's unit was sent to reinforce the 62nd Army in the besieged city of Stalingrad. There, he very quickly impressed his commanding officer with his exceptional marksmanship and was reassigned as a sniper. Typically, he would work with a spotter, allowing him to take full advantage of having an assistant. Zaitsev used the Russian M1891-30 Mosin-Nagant rifle, the sniper version of which was simply a production version that was deemed better made than others, with a simple telescopic sight and melted-down bolt added to accommodate it. The M1891-30 was a bolt-action rifle famed for its durability and reliability. It had a five-shot magazine and a range of 900 yards, which its powerful 7.62 millimeter round could cover in roughly one second. The mighty German 6th Army and the 4th Panzer Army had attacked the Russian city of Stalingrad, believing that with its weakened garrison it would fall in a matter of days, allowing them to advance towards the rich oil fields of the Caucasus Mountains. However, the Soviet leader Joseph Stalin had issued Order No. 227, instructing the defenders of Stalingrad that they would take not one step back. Therefore, as the German tanks and infantry started to push deeper into the city, they were met with increasingly determined and fierce resistance from the Soviet troops. Taking Stalin's order to heart, the city's defenders made the Germans pay for every step of ground as they advanced forward. From within bombed-out ruined buildings, they used grenades, anti-tank rifles, Molotov cocktails, and, of course, snipers to deadly effect. Then, an unexpected attack by Soviet reinforcements cut off the attacking Germans, trapping around a quarter million German troops in Stalingrad. However, at first, the Germans did not seem unduly worried and were confident they could defeat what they perceived as an army of poorly trained and ill-equipped peasants. Much to the German surprise, the Soviet troops proved resourceful and exceptionally gifted at fighting savage urban warfare. German officers complained that the Soviets fought like gangsters and did not play fair. Soon, German General Friedrich Paulus requested permission to break out of the city, but Hitler, remaining confident in a German victory, refused. Weeks of fighting quickly turned into months. The battle became a brutal war of attrition with the Red Army, attacking the encircled Germans constantly, day and night. Soviet snipers like Zaitsev started to specifically target German officers, and this tactic soon took a devastating toll on the German Army's morale and command structure. Zaitsev had a number of pioneering tactics that allowed him to become one of the top snipers of World War II. The different Soviet uniforms for summer and winter combat, which were respectively khaki and snow-colored, allowed him to blend in seamlessly into the ruins of Stalingrad, where he would wait patiently for his targets to come into range. Moreover, he effectively used decoys, which would draw the Germans' attention away from his own position. In some cases, Zaitsev was known to switch places with the dummy once the Germans had realized it was not real, catching them off guard. In order to tell where the German sniper was hiding, Zaitsev would hold up a helmet, which the enemy would shoot through. He would then put a rifle cleaning rod through the bullet hole to determine what direction the shot came from. Furthermore, it was important that Zaitsev killed with his first shot, as otherwise he would give away his own position and waste ammunition. 
which was scarce in Stalingrad as all Russian supplies had to be shipped across the three-kilometer-wide Volga River and were vulnerable to aerial bombardment by the Luftwaffe. The role of the sniper was not just to eliminate enemy targets. Zaitsev was also skilled at intelligence gathering, which he completed using a trench periscope. The information he gathered regarding German booby traps and impending assaults was passed on to infantry soldiers and doubtless saved many Soviet lives. Indeed, his constant sniping and intelligence gathering prevented the German army from reaching its full strength and initiating a full-on assault to push the Red Army over the Volga River and out of Stalingrad. The Soviet General Vasily Chuikov, who commanded the defense of Stalingrad, understood that his men needed inspiration if they were to endure a winter of hard fighting in the appalling conditions of Stalingrad. Zaitsev had an unflinching dedication to the Soviet cause and possessed a humble demeanor. Chuikov felt he was the perfect role model to inspire his hard-pressed troops. Zaitsev was heavily featured in Soviet propaganda and much effort was put into creating a cult of sniperism around him. The Soviets glamorized the myth of the almost superhuman lone sniper who was completely dedicated to their craft and was exceptionally patient and cunning. Soon, Zaitsev was the most famous and revered Red Army sniper of the war. Radio Moscow, which broadcast all across Europe and Asia in 22 languages, spoke constantly of his daily achievements, while the Red Army newspaper hailed him as a model soldier and citizen. Moreover, crudely printed flyers produced in Stalingrad itself spread information of his heroic deeds, which helped inspire the Soviet soldiers to fight relentlessly to save the city, much like Zaitsev. It was also realized by the Russian command that snipers like Zaitsev were having a tangible effect on the Germans in Stalingrad. As a result, they got him to set up a sniper school within the ruined buildings. At the sniper school, specially selected soldiers were given brief target training in the bombed-out Lazar chemical factory in central Stalingrad before being taken on live missions by Zaitsev to complete their training. The sniper school proved highly effective with its graduates killing over 3,000 Germans during the battle for Stalingrad. They were tasked to kill key enemy personnel like artillery observers, radio operators, and machine gunners. They were also sent on counter-sniping missions where they hunted down enemy snipers. Between November 10th to December 17th, 1942, in the frozen wasteland that was Stalingrad, Zaitsev killed 225 enemy soldiers, including 11 German snipers, an average of six kills a day. Soviet propaganda said that the Germans became so frustrated with Zaitsev's success that they had sent their own top sniper, Major Konings, sometimes referred to as Heinz Thornwall, to track him down and eliminate him. The propaganda alleged that after a three-day battle of wits, Zaitsev killed the enemy German sniper with a shot to the head. Konings was either hiding in a burned-out tank, a pillbox, or a sheet of iron. Zaitsev used his glove as a decoy, and when Konings shot it, he figured he was hiding under the iron sheet. Zaitsev fired a shot at the sheet and took out Konings. Despite being repeated in history books and popular movies, the historical accuracy of Zaitsev's duel is doubtful. For one, it is unlikely that the German high command would send their most skilled sniper to Stalingrad when they were fighting a bloody war along the vast Eastern Front and North Africa. Secondly, Stalingrad was a large city that stretched for 20 miles along the Volga River, and it's improbable that the two snipers would have been able to find one another for a duel. Finally, no historian has ever been able to prove the existence of a person called Major Koenigs or a Heinz Thorvald in the German army. In January 1943, Zaitsev was badly injured by an enemy mortar shell and nearly lost his eyesight. Due to his great value to the Soviet military, he was operated on by the pioneering eye surgeon, Dr. Vladimir Filatov. Zaitsev was able to make a full recovery and return to the front lines, training others to become snipers, commanded a mortar platoon, and became a regiment commander. He finished his fighting career at the Battle of Silo Heights, which was popularly known as the Gates of Berlin, as it was just 70 kilometers from the heart of the German capital. Unfortunately, Zaitsev was once again injured during the battle and did not take part in the Soviets' final assault on Berlin. For his sniping achievements, he was awarded the Hero of the Soviet Union Medal, which is equivalent to the British Victoria Cross or the American Medal of Honor. This award entitled him to a pension priority housing, a 50% rent reduction, medical benefits, and an annual free visit to a sanatorium. 
It is thought his tally of kills for the war was around 242, but some historians have suggested it may have been closer to 400. After the war, Zaitsev studied textiles at the university in Kiev. Upon graduating, he found work as an engineer and rose to become a director of a textile factory. He died in 1991 at the age of 76, just 11 days before the Soviet Union was dissolved. Zaitsev was initially laid to rest in Kiev, but in 2006, as per his final wishes, he was reburied in Volgograd, formerly known as Stalingrad, with full military honors. White Feather, the U.S. Marine sniper who shot through an enemy's own rifle scope. In military shooting circles, American Carlos Norman Hathcock II is a true legend. For he was a U.S. Marine sniper who's credited with killing at least 93 enemy soldiers in the Vietnam War from incredible distances with pinpoint accuracy. Though ruthless and calculating when hunting down his prey, behind his professional persona was a caring family man who saw killing as an end to a means. As he felt that for every one of the enemy that he killed, he would be potentially saving the life of some young American soldier. Carlos came from humble beginnings, being born in 1942 at Little Rock in Arkansas, and was raised by his grandparents after his parents separated when he was very young. From an early age, he would go hunting in the woods with his dog, using an old one-shot 22 caliber rifle to help put food on the family table. Throughout his childhood, he dreamed of becoming a U.S. Marine, so as soon as he reached 17 years of age, he enlisted in the Corps. His basic training was carried out at Camp Perry on the shore of Lake Erie in Ohio. This turned out to be the perfect place for Carlos to further improve and develop his natural talent for shooting, as the camp had the second largest outdoor rifle range in the world. He soon showed himself to be a crack shot, who was also naturally meticulous and precise when it came to the battlecraft of marksmanship. His talent soon quickly won him many championship shooting matches, including the prestigious Wimbledon Cup for long-range shooting in 1965. The competition required the contestants to hit targets with pinpoint accuracy from 1,000 yards away. Then Carlos was deployed to Vietnam as a military policeman, but this wouldn't last for long as the U.S. Marine Corps was starting to wake up to the fact that the Vietnam War was a very different kind of war. Soon there was the realization that there was a desperate need for fresh and innovative tactics if the war was to ever be won. So one of the new ideas put forward was to dramatically increase the number of snipers they were using, and Carlos was an obvious candidate. After completing a sniper training course in South Vietnam, his deadly skills were soon put to use. For most of his sniping career, Carlos was happy to use the standard U.S. Marine sniper rifle, the bolt-action Winchester Model 70, which was in the powerful .30-06 caliber. This rifle had a five-shot magazine and came with a telescopic sight that magnified the target by up to eight times. But on occasion, he used a Browning 50 caliber heavy machine gun that he had personally modified and added a telescopic sight to. This was an extremely heavy and clumsy weapon, being over five feet long, and when tripod mounted, weighed in at just under 130 pounds. Nevertheless, in the right circumstances, this weapon with its powerful round could not be matched in terms of both range and lethal effect. Carlos proved this in 1967, when he used it to set a new world record for the longest range sniper kill, hitting an enemy Viet Cong guerrilla squarely in the chest who was transporting rifles while on a push bike at a range of 2,500 yards, which is nearly one and a half miles. It took the 50 caliber bullet over two and a half seconds to travel that distance to the target. To give you some context, it would take you 20 minutes at a brisk walk to cover the same distance. This record was not beaten until 35 years later in 2002 by a Canadian sniper in Afghanistan. Carlos had built up a formidable reputation during his time in Vietnam. In fact, he proved so effective as a sniper that he gained the nickname of White Feather after the white feather he always wore on the band of his bush hat. Carlos was able to get in the bubble, a zen-like mode where he was in a state of utter, complete, absolute concentration, where every breeze and leaf meant something. He would even be able to go without proper sleep for days as he tracked his target. One time, he killed the sadistic female Viet Cong platoon leader called the Apache Woman. She was a Vietnamese platoon leader, interrogator, and sniper with a high number of kills, but what she was known most for was her torture methods. Apache would take great pleasure in torturing captive U.S. Marines, including flaying them alive. 
she would do this within earshot of the U.S. base so they could hear her victim's screams. Carlos, hearing this, had had enough, so he took up the task to eliminate her, even if it was an obvious counter-sniper trap. He noticed her going to the toilet and called an artillery strike on the position, killing three of the Viet Cong snipers. As she got up and fled, Carlos landed a shot and she fell. He then made a follow-up shot, just in case. As White Feather's tally started to mount, the enemy began to fear him so much that they put a $30,000 bounty on his head, which is over a quarter of a million dollars in today's value for anyone that killed him. This was by far the highest bounty put on a U.S. sniper during the entire conflict. So many enemy snipers tried to claim this bounty, but all failed miserably, most dying in the process as he ruthlessly picked them off one by one. On one occasion, he was in a sniper duel with an elite enemy sniper, codenamed the Cobra. While tracking the Cobra, Carlos noticed the sniper's glint from his scope. Studying the crosshairs from the Winchester Model 70 onto it, he squeezed the trigger. The bullet had traveled at a long range through the sniper's own telescopic sight, straight into his eye socket, killing him instantly. Carlos realized that to make such an incredible shot, that the Cobra must have spotted him at the same time. He understood that he was just slightly quicker that time, and had a great respect for his foe's abilities. He took the rifle as a souvenir and tagged it, although he would never see it again. At times, Carlos had to make difficult decisions. One of his shots, 1,500 yards away from a hilltop, was on a 12-year-old Viet Cong guerrilla who was transporting weapons and ammunition on a bicycle to an enemy patrol. He didn't want to kill men, and certainly not children, but he realized if action wasn't taken, that the guns would be used on his fellow Marines. He gently pushed his thumbs on the 50 cal's trigger, firing a shot at the front wheel of the bicycle, sending the boys somersaulting over the handlebars. The warning shot didn't make the boy run away as planned. When he picked up an AK-47 and began firing at the hill, Carlos dropped him dead with one well-aimed shot. This situation would go on to haunt him forever. Carlos volunteered for a mission just days before the end of his first deployment. This mission was to eliminate a North Vietnamese general in his own headquarters deep in the forest. He had to do it at a close range of 800 yards or less, and he was to do it alone without a spotter. This was the mission where he removed his white feather out of his hat. Carlos put vegetation in his buttonholes and straps and covered his skin in camouflage paint to match the surroundings. As the general emerged from the plantation house and walked towards his car, Carlos held his breath and squeezed the trigger, killing the general with a shot to the chest. No one had seen the muzzle flash, and no patrols came after him. Carlos would eventually be credited with an official confirmed total of 93 sniper kills. But the true total was probably several hundreds more as the system for acknowledging confirmed kills was stringent in the extreme as it required an officer and a spotter to be present when the kill was made. In 1969, his frontline combat career came to an abrupt end, when the LVT-5 amphibious armored fighting vehicle he was in struck a mine as it traveled on a highway near his marine base. The vehicle became engulfed in flames, but despite this, Carlos courageously went about rescuing several fellow marines from the inferno, even though there was the danger of the vehicle's ammunition exploding at any moment. Carlos suffered severe burns to his body as he did so. In a critical state, he was medevaced by helicopter to a nearby hospital ship. And once his condition had stabilized, he was sent to a naval hospital in Tokyo, Japan. Later, he was flown back to America for specialist treatment at a Burns Hospital in San Antonio, Texas. He received the Purple Heart Medal for being wounded in action that day, but it was not until 30 years later that his bravery was recognized, and he was awarded the Silver Star for his gallantry. It took him several months to recover from his burns. Once he had returned to active service, he stayed in the United States, spending the next few years helping establish the Marine Corps Sniper School in Quantico, Virginia. But by 1975, he was starting to be in poor health as he had been diagnosed with multiple sclerosis, and over the next four years, his health declined even more. This was to such an extent that in 1979, at the age of just 37 years old, and now a gunnery sergeant, he was forced to retire just 55 days short of 20 years of service due to medical grounds. Civilian life was not at first an easy thing for Carlos to adapt to. He suffered from depression and his marriage nearly failed because of it. But eventually he worked his way through it, taking up shark fishing, which provided him the challenge he needed to keep himself focused. 
He also became an instructor to various police departments and U.S. Special Forces, teaching the finer points of sniping to a new generation of sharpshooters. Sadly, the multiple sclerosis would eventually claim his life in 1999. He was just 56 at the time of his death. His son would follow in his footsteps by joining the U.S. Marines. Carlos had a special high-grade variant of the M21 semi-automatic sniper rifle named after him. The manufacturer is Springfield Armory, named it the M25 White Feather Tactical Rifle in his honor. Carlos's original military-issue sniper rifle can be seen at the Marine Corps Sniper Museum in Quantico, Virginia, where it's currently on display. Sniper Shields, World War I Sniper shields were one of the technical innovations that appeared on the battlefield of the First World War. There are many variants of sniper shields, ranging from lightweight to heavy versions, and were inspired by the mantlets from centuries before. The first sniper shields, or set shields, were introduced by the British, who used them on an enormous scale. Reports say that in 1917, over 200,000 were deployed on the Western Front. They had a typical design with a loophole for the rifle, which could be protected by a shutter. These shields were capable of protecting against German rounds at a distance of 50 yards, but could be penetrated by reversed bullets. The Germans also designed and used sniper shields. At first, they used large magnesium steel plates that were being placed on trench parapets. Later, they introduced the Model 1916 Infanterie Shield, a 24-inch wide, 18-inch tall sniper shield weighing 30 pounds. The silicon nickel steel plate was 0.23 inches thick and was able to protect from British 303 rounds at a distance of 100 yards. The plate had a loophole designed for a right-hand sniper and a movable shutter. Some models even had a double loophole for binoculars at the center of the plate. The shield plate was slightly bent along its edges to protect against shrapnel and ricochets. Even though it was designed for mobile use, the Model 1916 sniper shield was too heavy to carry around, especially while crawling. Furthermore, it's designed only to protect the shooter from the front side. The Germans therefore inserted the shields into trench parapets, covering them with sandbags and hiding them with camouflage. Protected with these shields, placed at intervals of 100 yards in disposition to protect each other's flanks, German snipers became a difficult obstacle for British soldiers. Since the Model 1916 sniper shields were not able to protect the shooter from armor-piercing shells and heavy-caliber hunting rifles that the British introduced onto the battlefield, the Germans designed a stronger model, referred to as the Model 1916-1917, with a steel plate thickness of 0.42 inches. The shield was wider at 26 inches wide and was 12 inches tall and had a mouse-hole aperture at the bottom of the plate. This model also had side plates that were used as the stand and the protection for the sniper from ricochets and lead splash. However, this sniper shield weighed 50 pounds and was very difficult to handle. Besides the German and British designs, sniper shields were being used by other armies as well. The common thing for all of them was that they were too heavy and cumbersome for mobile use for which they were initially designed. The McAdam Shield Shovel We attack World War I the McAdam Shield Shovel, or Hughes Shovel, was a two-in-one solution designed for the trenches of World War I by a Canadian named Sam Hughes, who was the Minister for the Department of Militia and Defense in 1913. The device would resemble a standard infantry shovel with a hole in it, so that it could also act as a sniper's shield. The shovel would be named after Ina McAdam, Hughes's personal secretary who suggested the idea in 1913 when she saw Swiss troops digging trenches and suggested that they could combine their entrenching tools with bulletproof shields. To use it as a shield, the soldier would lie in prone with the rifle placed through the hole, with the shovel handle rotated 90 degrees to expose the spike that drove into the ground. In 1914, 25,000 shield shovels were produced for the Canadian Army. Hughes proclaimed them a Canadian miracle device, but after field testing, it was clear that the expensive piece of equipment had many problems. It was heavy because of the thick steel necessary to deflect a bullet, and difficult to carry as it had no carrying handle. Even worse, the shield shovel couldn't actually deflect bullets, even if they were small in caliber and was not good for digging because of the hole in the blade. High-ranking Canadian and British military officials, including Arthur Curry, refused to accept the shield shovel. It was stated by Saturday Night Magazine that the McAdam Shield Shovel was only good for one thing, 
opening tins. The shovels were soon replaced by British entrenching tools and turned into scrap metal, although some Canadian snipers did make use of the device, placing many together for effective protection. Ghillie Suit Military Tech In the modern history of armed conflicts, snipers were considered amongst the greatest menace on the battlefield. These sharpshooters were a constant threat with their highly precise aimed shots appearing from nowhere. It was the inability to spot snipers that made them so lethal. Every sniper had to be a good shooter as much as a bad target. Proper concealment was therefore the key to their success. When snipers first entered the scene in the early 20th century, they were followed by a special camouflage suit that allowed them excellent concealment, the ghillie suit. Ghillie suits originate from Scotland. In the old Scottish mythology, the term ghillie was connected to the earth spirit, ghillie a male fairy of the highlands with dark hair and clothes made of leaves and moss. Since the end of the 16th century, the term was attached to a special kind of servant, one who attends sportsmen in the Scottish highlands. In Scotland, this referred to game wardens, people who were responsible for maintaining game on a lord's estate. Apart from their main duties, ghillies occasionally had the task of stalking and capturing live animals such as deer that would be shot by their masters in a mock hunt. In order to sneak up to the animal, the ghillie had to be perfectly concealed. They did so with the help of suits they specially designed for the occasion, decorated with strips of cloth, grass, bracken, and foliage. The suit allowed them to blend into the surroundings, and this was how the ghillie suit was invented. Ghillie suits were introduced to the military by the very same highly respected Scottish Highland Game Wardens. In 1900, during the Second Boer War, Simon Fraser, 14th Lord Lovat, organized them into the Lovat Scouts Regiment. To their outstanding observation and concealment skills, military training was added, resulting in highly skilled reconnaissance units. Along with the Lovato Scouts came their invention from back home, the ghillie suit. After the war was over, the unit went through several reorganizations, but continued to exist in the First World War. In 1916, these scouts were deployed to the 1st British Sniper Unit. Their performance as sharpshooters and observers during the war was outstanding. The scouts' greatest contribution, however, was the introduction of ghillie suits through the sniper schools where they were engaged as instructors. Ghillie suits changed very little in their essence after the First World War. At first, they were put into practice by the British Army. During World War II, the Germans also adopted this method of camouflage for their snipers. Only the British and the Germans used them on a larger scale during the war, as these two powers were the only ones who emphasized the importance of camouflage for their snipers. The Americans and Soviets, meanwhile, preferred marksmanship and other sniping skills over concealment. After World War II, ghillie suits gradually entered into armies all over the world and became an essential piece of equipment for sniper units. The basics of making a ghillie suit haven't changed much since its origins. It comes down to meeting two basic demands. Breaking the line of the sniper's body. The human body is one of the most recognizable forms for the human brain. By wearing a ghillie suit, the sniper acquires an irregular form, therefore making him much more difficult to be discovered. Blending in with the surroundings. Each disruption in either form or color in nature is easily perceptible to the human eye and could reveal the sniper's position. That's why the ghillie suit has to blend as much as possible into the surrounding terrain where snipers are deployed. The shape and appearance of the ghillie suit depends on the field of operation. They are successfully used in various kinds of environments, from thick forests, over deserts, and even in urban areas. This means most military ghillie suits are custom, handmade to suit the demands of the terrain. The ghillie suit is simple in its essence. It has a base uniform with camouflage features attached most often a thick layer of twines of various length and colors. Making a ghillie suit, however, is a demanding process that asks for a lot of patience and time. The suit maker has to spend a lot of time studying the terrain and its features. After that, hours and hours of work are spent on making the suit, so it has all the camouflage features and to make it durable for use in the field. The final product has to form a perfect camouflage in order to secure the sniper from being spotted and getting killed on the battlefield. In most cases, snipers themselves make the suit to fit their own demands. There are two common ways to make a ghillie suit. The simple method is to use a poncho or a camo net as a base where twines would be attached. 
Such a suit is worn over a standard uniform. In the second method, modified military uniforms are used as a base for the suit, or coveralls. Uniforms are modified by adding thicker layers of fabric onto the torso to provide a sniper some comfort while lying on the ground for a prolonged period of time. The material for making twines has changed over time. For most of the time, burlap and jute were used to make twines, primarily because of their sturdiness and durability. Over time, nylon and other artificial materials made their way. Since they're all extremely flammable, a special kind of self-extinguishing material is used today. In order to bring the suit as close as possible to the environment, snipers use local elements such as grass, twigs, vines, and even whole branches with leaves. These elements, however, are not predefined and are attached to the suit right on the spot. As important as the body suit is the ghillie hat. It could be considered the most important element, as the sniper's head is the most exposed part of his body. The camouflage principle is the same as with the body suit. Camouflage twines are attached to the hat to form a hanging drape around the head. The same goes for the rifle that protrudes most from the sniper's figure. The standard way of concealing the weapon was to wrap it with the same twines as on the suit. Even though ghillie suits are one of the best ways to conceal the sniper's position, they do come with problems. The bulkiness of the suit serves perfectly for breaking the human figure form, but at the same time makes the movement of the sniper quite difficult, especially in cases where he needs to run away from his position. A much bigger problem lies in the fact that ghillie suits are very warm. While this may be a good feature in cold weather, in warmer areas it comes up as a huge issue. The temperature in the suit goes up to 122 degrees Fahrenheit, or 50 degrees Celsius. For snipers who spend hours, sometimes even days, out in the field, such high temperatures can cause dehydration and other serious health issues. In these cases, ghillie suits could be replaced with so-called sniper capes. Finally, even though the ghillie suit does hide the sniper from being spotted by the human eye, it's completely powerless against thermal detection. In conditions of modern warfare, a sniper wearing the perfect ghillie suit in a thick forest cannot escape the eye of thermal goggles. For more than 100 years, ghillie suits have seen extensive military use, primarily for the use by snipers and scouts. With all its pros and cons, it is still the best way for snipers to conceal themselves on the battlefield. Sniper Decoys Dummy Head World War I The First World War saw extensive use of snipers in combat. For the first time, rifles with telescopic sights were used on a large scale, which under the conditions of trench warfare were considered very effective. At first, the German Imperial Army were the only ones to seriously consider scoped rifles. As soon as the British and French were aware of the German successes with scoped rifles, they also introduced them to the battlefield. Even though sharpshooters existed before, it was the introduction of scopes that allowed them to shoot accurately at very long distances. With a scoped rifle, a good marksman was able to acquire his target very easily. He could kill an enemy that barely protruded his head over the trench parapet if he was fast enough. With such horrifying capabilities, snipers became an object of fear for the soldiers in the trenches, especially because they fired from well-concealed positions. Since the art of camouflaging was developing more and more as the war progressed, snipers became harder to detect. For soldiers whose everyday life was weighted by the threat of snipers, it became a necessity to counter this danger. With the awareness of the sniper threat widespread, soldiers paid a lot of attention not to expose themselves. This forced snipers to act quickly and to use the shortest moment to fire at the enemy. It was based on this hastiness that camouflage units designed their deception. Their intention was to force the enemy sniper into making a flawed decision and to draw out his fire so his position could be located. One of the most popular decoys of the war were paper mache heads. Paper mache was a very popular material before the war and was used in making dolls and various components for amusement parks, carnivals, and expositions. It was very cheap, but to make it consisted of chopping down pieces of paper reinforced with any kind of bounding material whether it was glue or plain starch. Besides the fact that it was cheap, it was also very good for modeling. The job of making decoy heads out of paper mache was entrusted to camouflage units, who were working in their small improvised workshops on the front lines. 
Sculptors working in these workshops made a huge variety of decoy heads with great precision and resemblance to real human heads. Special attention was given to shaping face details and coloring the face to look like real skin. This push for realism was necessary because they were to be observed through scopes with magnifying lenses. In order to increase the realistic look of the head, some of these were equipped with rubber surgical tubes connected to the mouth with a cigarette in it. By blowing air through the tube, an impression of a soldier smoking a cigarette was made. This increased the possibility of attracting the attention of the sniper. Paper mache heads were usually stuck on a long stick in order to securely lift it over the parapet. If the deception was successful and the dummy head was hit by a sniper, bullet holes were then used to locate the sniper with the help of a triangulation method. Or another method was to slide a periscope into the head and spot the sniper that way. Once the approximate location was established, the sniper's position was bombarded by artillery or counter snipers would focus on that area. The technique of dummy heads was invented by the British, who at the beginning of the war had a lot of problems with German snipers. This method was a result of their struggle to fight the hidden enemy. The same method would also be used by other sides, 